welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us from Switchback Worlds, and, and the ma the madman behind our spell is Steel, Dice Golem, and most recently, Voyager Tactics. The one and only Saito Kun. How you doing today, man? I'm doing well. It's, uh, it's a nice, bright morning here, mm -hmm. and uh, we're ready to go. Yep. So. A bit of a tradition around here, aside from all the drinking, is going into the humble beginnings, as it were, when it comes to someone's tabletop journey. So, mm. with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what made it stick. Uh, right, so, for me, uh, how I would describe myself is I'm also... I'm quite a relative newcomer to the RPG scene. Uh, it was around, I forget when, maybe 2020 perhaps, that uh, one of my Discord server friends invited me to play uh, a D&D game with them and a few others, 5th uh, edition. And that was sort of when I started. And since then, uh, since then I really got interested in just like role playing games in general and uh, just like the design aspects of it. And since then, I've looked into like so, yeah, I mean, I started with Face Edition, but eventually I did uh, just started researching into a lot of different uh, systems like Pathfinder and all of that first to sort of maybe look into what else I could play. But as I started getting more into the design aspects, it became more into like finding out how I could uh, use them as like, you know, design tools and all that. And since then, uh, I guess that, that's been sort of the part I've been most uh, involved in is more of, the, I guess, the RPG aspects of it. Uh, I don't actually uh, play or DM as much as, or GM as much as I actually uh, design, truth be told. Well, at least you didn't fall into the trap of being a forever GM. <laughs> well, uh, I don't quite have the jamming chops yet. I would like to, probably in the future, at least. Mm -hmm. So, and it it's quite... Going from a 5e introduction to do, to doing a Forge in the Dark um, TR, TRPG with our spell is Steel. How did you how did you first get introduced to um, to the Forge in the Dark system? Uh, mainly through my research. So actually, uh, Voyager Tactics is the first uh, game. I worked on, uh, it's just that it's ongoing, and uh, with our spell is steel. What happened is, uh, since it came after Voyager Tactics, Voyager Tactics was made kind of from scratch, completely original. But I wanted to just make like a quick project based on like an idea I had uh, around like a magic uh, kind of setting, and. I knew that I didn't want to take up too much time to sort of make a new system from scratch. So then I went researching into, you know, what are the systems that people use to sort of base uh, their own games on. And I saw, you know, a lot of uh, Power by the Apocalypse was sort of, I guess, the most common one. And that sort of led me to, so led me to Blaze in the Dark, which I had heard of before at the time, so I was always sort of interested in checking it out and just sort of 
for me searching it more and sort of seeing how it worked, I think it really kind of grabbed my attention how its system worked and that's sort of what led me to choose uh, that as the basis to build uh, our spell still on and it was a, a good experience to sort of uh, make like an actual finished uh, RPG project uh, on its own because uh, uh, I sort of went about it backwards where you're supposed to start with smaller projects and then work your way up but for me I sort of already started with Voyager uh, as a really big ongoing project uh, and uh, a lot of the stuff I learned on our spell still I sort of applied back into Voyager Wait, you're supposed to start with a small project and work your way up? No one told me <laughs> Well, general practices I guess Yeah, then, then again, um, then, then, then again, um, there is the, there's the old freight, there's the old saying, you can't eat anything bigger than your head. Yeah. So, so, um, is it, a, is it a case where vo the idea for Voyager Tactics came, for, came first, but you ended up completing our spell is steel as a way to do something relatively, um, simpler to kind of build some experience uh yeah because the uh, voyager tactics is about i say two almost three years old by now and it's gone through numerous uh, versions and revisions that uh but before it was a uh, uh, rpg it was definitely uh like just my own universe that i made uh, back then and sort of populated with my ideas and it took on many different forms at first I was thinking of maybe making it like a comic series or a video series or something like that because uh, uh, primarily I consider myself an artist more than uh, more than a game designer uh, which I still kind of consider as more of a hobby but uh, I am an artist by trade, so making Voyager's universe, uh, I sort of intended for it at first to be, you know, uh, some sort of visual medium. But as I got into role playing games and game design, uh, I guess it sort of fell into place that maybe Voyager's uh, world sort of fit more into the context of a game because at the time uh, what I struggled with was sort of finding like a real narrative thread for it uh, because I had like a lot of ideas for the world I loved world building for it and making characters for it but I didn't necessarily have like a singular story in mind for it uh, which is sort of what impeded me at first in sort of figuring out you know what should I make this into uh, but then when I started getting to RPGs, that sort of made me think, you know, if uh, I couldn't make, I couldn't think of any single story for it, what, a, what if I just made the world into a sandbox that uh, anyone else, including myself, can make their own stories in? And that's sort of uh, what led me to uh, convert Voyager into like an RPG setting and sort of learning uh, learning from there and it started of course with um, in like the earliest versions with a lot of influence from 5th uh, edition since that's what I started with and then branching and learning more about different systems and then implementing uh, them so it's been sort of like a very iterative process of just sort of uh, finding the game's identity more and more mm -hmm. uh, as its own type of system, and I can, I can cert, I can certainly uh, get behind, get behind that. Now, with that, with that in mind, I'd like, I'd like to go into some of the, um, some of the pillars that you, that you had talked about this, within within the opening chapters of Voyager Tactics to just get just get a feel for 
um, what you what you started to settle on when it came to developing the game's voice, for lack of a better term. Um, so, mm. I suppose the, I suppose the first one is the fact that you t you talked about tactics, tiles, and turns, and the influence of that being Arc Knights and Fire Emblem. I'll lean more into Fire Emblem on, on this because um, because of my policies, I have not touched Arc Knights at all. Yeah. So when you talk when you you talk about um pl about planning out turns and you and using a tile map um is it is it a case where you wanted to re you wanted to reward proper pl proper planning and tactics within the gameplay loop for um Voyager? Mm, I think I think at its core it has a lot to do with just uh, the vibe that I imagined because uh, I very much enjoyed uh, these type of games that had uh, the tile map and the feeling of like moving your character and sort of planning out your turn and for me that's it just had a certain uh, a certain quality to it that uh, which that made me sort of insist on having tiles as opposed to say, uh, you know, m like how more modern RPGs tend to uh, go away from tiles and more towards abstract zones or theater, theater of the mind. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think uh, having the tiles just feels like something that I know that I should keep because it just feels like it is like part of the identity I want to sell, uh, not just for the game itself, but perhaps also to uh, other people who uh, may hear of like the influences used in the game and would be interested as well. Mm -hmm. So the se the second pillar is um re is reactive combat, and I. You mentioned in the, as far as the influences, um, Genshin Impact and Honkai. I have played a I have played a little bit of Genshin back back when it um, first came out, um, and Honkai Star Rail. I have I haven't touched, but you was it a but what what would, what in speci what in particular did you want to draw from when it came to those two games? Right, so. Uh, for those, I did pick like uh, two kind of the more I guess uh, well-known anime-relevant titles, mm -hmm. just so that it's easier for people to get on board. But there are like quite a number of different influences as well, uh, and one of them uh, is uh, League of Legends, which uh, I have played a fair amount of, and what I liked about how League's combat works is a sort of a uh, teamwork aspect, at least when you can get your team to cooperate, uh, that I like the whole team fight aspect of it, where you have multiple people sort of chaining different skills together and like layering crowd control and damage in different manners and sort of uh, playing off each other in very spontaneous ways. So... Uh, I guess for a non-league player, an example is if like this character uses an ability to pull an enemy into your team, and then another uh, character would try to stun the stun the enemy that was pulled to try to prevent them to escape, and then you all sort of wail on them. So there's a sort of very spontaneous uh, planning going on. And as for uh, Genshin Impact and Honkai Star Rail that I mentioned, uh, what sort of inspired me at first when working on Voyager was sort of uh, Genshin Impact's element system, how you could sort of chain together uh, like effects like water and ice to freeze uh, enemies and uh, I think it's sort of uh, this is a very strong influence early on but I think afterwards uh, it didn't focus, uh, Voyager doesn't focus so much now on elemental effects, but I still 
liked the underlying philosophy of having this sort of reactive effects that uh, really sort of emphasizes teamwork and uh, teamwork between players in a way that's very uh, tangible and very uh, fun as well because you know it has a very flashy effect usually associated with it and it's very easy to imagine uh, characters doing it because there's a lot of uh, niches you can fill like uh, like this you know like who is going to be the fire character who's going to be the one who freezes there's uh, certain clear roles that can be inferred from them and another another influence in this category is uh, Divinity Original Sin 2 which I also played a lot with uh, friends and this kind of uh, it's kind of spontaneous planning and uh, using the tools at your disposal is uh, kind of the field that I wanted to capture with the design of the system. Mm -hmm. And the th and go going forward into that is is of course um, invoking Ruby went with what you referred to as anime style combat, which a lot of people have tried to replicate um, what they refer to as anime style combat, but I think the tricky thing is um, do, is doing something so inherently visual in a mo in something that's going to require theater of the mind, where you can't necessarily have that level of visuals, unless you animate everybody's actions. And <laughs> I don't think yeah. even you have the patience to do that many drawings. No, that's not at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that is yeah, that is why I listed Ruby as an influence because uh, yeah, anime style is quite broad, but um, uh, if you've seen uh, I mean, if anyone has seen Ruby uh, we, did does a have a base. we did a whole reconstruction of Ruby um, on this channel a while back Oh, you have? I didn't see that video that was a that was a while ago. It was part. It was a four part thing because we built it around four arcs of three volumes. Um, the The idea was not to fix, but rather tweak a few things early on and then see where it go, see where it goes from there. Though I did I did um, throw shade at Miles Luna and Carrie Shawcross because of some things <laughs> that they do as writers that I don't like. Wow, uh, <laughs> small will because uh, yeah, because before before I was a game designer, I was or well, kind of am still a Ruby content creator. I make Ruby videos, uh, and that's I guess Ruby has been sort of uh, well, I guess Ruby has been kind of the reason uh, Voyager exists. Actually, it's because. Uh, I was making, you know, a sort of story or fan fiction based on Ruby, but, uh, but of course, working with uh, a copyrighted work, you kind of not able to explore all the ideas you want to explore without, you know, compromising the original intent of the work, which sort of led me to wanting to uh, create an original world that still kind of evoked what I liked about Ruby uh, uh, in its DNA and that's sort of what led to the creation of Voyager from uh, that intention. But um, yeah, so for like the anime star combat, uh, I don't mean something along the scale of like a shonen anime like, you know, like Dragon Ball and anything like that where you're like literally leveling mountains or, you know, throwing uh, any number of gigantic things or giant beams at people um, and it's not on the rather low end of say uh, Fire Emblem where yeah there's like it's clearly a bit you know larger than life that's like you know uh, you're on flying mounts there's dragons and all that but the action is still decidedly grounded uh, but what I liked about Ruby uh, Ruby's style of action in particular is that it still had a lot of room for the kind of uh, over-the-top 
uh, superhuman feats you expect. Um, for so for like jumping great distances, super speed, uh, different types of powers. But uh, what I liked it it still had a very um tangible tactile quality to its action because of course Ruby had like all the weapons. Uh, and there's just a very it's a it's a very nice middle ground that I liked, and of course this owes a lot of uh, its vibe to uh, Monty Ohm's animations and all that. But uh, that's sort of what I wanted to capture, where uh, you had these sort of very uh, you can perform very uh, over the top feats, but within like certain rules, which is why I think. A lot of people think that Ruby would work excellently as a like a video game or video game series is because uh, how the action operates in this world is when you watch it, it feels like it it operates within very uh, very defined rules. Like it doesn't go over over the top, if that makes sense. And uh, looking at it, I think that sort of uh, lent itself well to what I wanted to design and I think uh, and for what I've seen because I've studied of course a lot of different uh, tabletop RPGs uh, of course uh, independent ones that I've tried to sort of replicate that kind of Ruby feel so like you know unofficial Ruby tabletops I know of at least two uh, and both of them uh, have opted for the more theater of the mind approach, meaning you don't necessarily have a map, you kind of imagine what's happening. And I think that approach does make sense for Ruby because, you know, they're kind of still doing very wild things, they have very varied powers. And to do that, it is kind of hard to imagine how they would do that in a D&D style grid map. So you sort of kind of imagine them and they sort of abstractify the distances to far, near, and close, or melee, and that's sort of how uh, these two other systems I've seen do it. But for me, uh, I sort of, uh, I guess, kind of enjoyed the challenge of how do I make such like a, like an anime style combat system like Ruby's work within the space of a fairly you know grounded visual space of like a map with tiles and how do you do that without making it seem overly restrictive and solving that puzzle i think has been kind of the main uh, thing that i've been trying to work around with the sort of four versions of voyager that i've been working on so far and i think up to this point i sort of reach something that I think is the closest I think I can get to that. Mm -hmm. And no, with that with that in mind, um, and I I will note I I will note there's a few other points of influence that you met that you mentioned um in one of the in one of the other servers that you that you and I happen to be in because I'm ev I'm everywhere. <laughs> I'm here. There is not there is not a single place that I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was it was the it was the fact that you had meant you had mentioned the setting um being somewhat inspired by Destiny and I'm curious what how exactly um that ca that carries through. Ah, so yeah, so I've played a fair amount of Destiny 2 um, around the time where it went free to play. Mm -hmm. But even before that, I was very much captured by uh, Destiny's world and concept, even when it was first announced, uh, the first game. Because uh, what really captured me about Destiny's setting is that. Um, it kind of had this very ideal mix between uh, fantasy and sci-fi that I liked, where there was this uh, futuristic world with like guns and 
uh, spaceships and all that. But uh, one, it was still kind of decidedly Earth centered. Uh, there were like aliens, but um, the kind of idea is more that you're defending the last city on Earth, and and even where with all these um, uh, sci-fi elements, there is a very fantastical mystical quality in just the way that uh, they present uh, the, ele- the sci-fi elements where uh, the guardians which are like the protagonists of uh, the destiny world they're sort of they have like you know these sci-fi helmets and all that but they also have uh, swords they have uh, heraldry they have emblems they have uh, raiment cloaks uh, so it's a very uh, interesting idea of having this kind of almost like futuristic knights in that sense and just the general idea of the rest of Destiny's law because uh, I looked into a lot of its law and uh, gameplay and all sorts of info about it back when I was really interested in the setting that it really had this sort of uh, fantastical quality because even uh, the aliens sort of had like their own uh, mythos to them and uh, I guess the underlying themes of the world as well was a lot centered a lot around uh, the traveler and these sort of mystical concepts that um, that while are painted with a sci-fi exterior don't actually have you know overly uh, scientific terminology or anything like that it has it's more I guess like a sort of flavor I suppose and it was just like a very nice um fusion of the two that I liked and mm-hmm. it was sort of it was sort of very adjacent to Ruby as well because Ruby is also a very similar type of pastiche where it has this sort of fantasy uh, kind of fantasy world with monsters and uh, all these creatures and a very final fantasy type of mineral crystal power source and these characters that are based on fairy tales but with you know these very futuristic modern uh, transforming weapons, they have airships and robots, and uh, that sort of um, adjacency between Destiny and Ruby was something that I sort of picked up on uh, that grabbed me, and that was something that I also wanted to capture with a Voyager. So that sort of informed me a lot and like how I wanted to go about the world, and that sort of. Uh, so it was very nice for me because that meant that nearly anything that I found cool from any sort of media I liked, uh, I sort of enjoyed because uh, I could use uh, Voyager's setting as almost like my own personal sandbox to just uh, to implement like how would uh, an idea of a night work in my world? How would the idea of uh, a mage work and sort of what sort of spin could I give them would it be uh, a bit more futuristic would it look a bit more modern or fantastic fantastical and they're sort of uh, sort of like juggling these different aesthetics together uh, is sort of like a very fun creative exercise for me in fleshing out Voyager's world of which uh, Destiny was a very big influence as well mm-hmm now, more more recently, in in fact, in the um, in the update that was put up, well, to, well today, yeah, or today. yet or yesterday in your case, since it lists as it, as it being put up seven hours ago. Um, uh, yeah, it's meant one. It is mentioned that there were a f- that there were a few changes, and one of them I did want to get into is. Having your stats be spheres, which early in now, I I obviously I came into this late, but at some yeah. point early on in development, were your stats more akin to traditional stats instead of this sphere-based design? Uh, yeah, early on, uh, around version, well, I guess the earliest versions, it was, uh, it was definitely a very traditional. Uh, uh, 
stat based thing. Well, but instead of, I think instead of uh the classic D and D six stats, I was using a five stat split. So one was for, one was like strength, one was like dexterity, one was like uh toughness, I believe. Uh, one was for magic and one was for intelligence. So I guess for what I remembered intelligence and wisdom were kind of folded together but um, over time what I sort of uh, you know after playing more more games uh, and 5th edition I sort of uh, I sort of experimented a lot with going with a statless system and which is to say that uh, because I didn't like you know tracking things like modifiers and seeing you know, whether I had a proficiency in a given thing and just sort of having to refer to a sheet all the time. Um, so for what uh, for me, what I did was uh, experimented with a lot of different designs. The version before this uh, also did not have stats. Uh, it had it was almost entirely skill based, meaning uh, you had like a bunch of skills or abilities rather. So anything from like uh, your spells, so anything that's sort of actionable. So I was thinking a lot in terms of uh, verbs. So your anything that is on your character sheet is just things that you can do, not necessarily what you are. Um, because what you are sort of uh, determine more from like role play and narrative, but uh, after that, I sort of you know studied a bit more into it, and I do. I did sort of begin to see the benefit of having at least some form of stat system, because uh, while you know skill based system sort of focus more on like what you can do and sort of what you're trained to do. Uh, stats are like a handy way to sort of uh, figure out what is like not necessarily who you are but sort of like your makeup I suppose because uh, I was also thinking from the perspective of a <clears throat> like a new player like uh, because you know when you're in the, the thick of game design and like doing all sorts of novel concepts uh, I think you can lose sight or forget that uh, most uh, most RPG players are not going to be like you and they're just going to sort of be looking at a very uh, large part of text and trying to figure out, okay, what do I need to play? And for me, uh, I think I saw the usefulness in stats in that, you know, if I see at a glance you know, what does this say about my character? And I think that's a very useful thing to have. So that led me to creating the sphere system, which, uh, to quickly explain it, the sphere systems, I don't want to call them uh, elements, but they are somewhat like that, in that they represent uh, certain celestial spheres, so there's five of them, which is uh, sun, earth, sky, moon and star mm -hmm. and those and I think the easiest way I can sort of explain them to someone that would make sense is they're kind of like Hogwarts houses in the sense that when you look at the description and flavor of uh, this thing this faction or this whatever you want to call it you already get an idea of what uh, ideals uh, that thing and bodies, what colors are associated with it, what sort of actions are associated with it. So uh, that was kind of what I wanted to evoke, it was something that was kind of abstract, but uh, evocative enough to inform people that, oh, if I, if I um, uh, picked a character with a sun sphere, be uh, because basically a character creation you can align yourself with up to two spheres. So this could be Sun Earth or it could be Sun Sun if you're like really uh, honing in on that specific 
uh, sphere, but if you're part of the sun sphere, uh, as I meant, you're more fiery, you're more passionate, uh, and also governed by your emotion, you're more impulsive. If you're of the moon sphere, you are more deliberate, uh, slow, slow to act, but calculative and uh, conscientious. If you were of the earth sphere, you were stable, you were uh, more of a guardian, you value tradition and stability. And uh, I knew that using the spheres or which of course comprises, which of course uh, evokes the idea of like certain elements like fire or earth uh, would help a lot in the player understanding what sort of personality traits these evoked. And of course, uh, this of course took a lot of inspiration from, you know, like uh, Avatar The Last Airbender where uh, each of the four elements very clearly evokes um, a certain personality, like, you know, fire, uh, fire is, the firebenders are normally associated with industry and passion, but, you know, within... It's uh, within... funny you mentioned Avatar because each of the... Be before Korra came along and mucked this up, each of the bending styles was heavily based on um, a particular style of martial art. Um, yeah, yeah, it was. Um, airbending was um, built on Bagua Zhong. Um, earthbending was built on Hung Gar. Well, except for Toph, who was using Southern Praying Mantis. Um, firebending was rooted in Northern Shaolin. And water bending was rooted in Tai Chi. Yeah. So. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and those movements. Yeah, so everything from like you know the movements and uh, how it's presented is evokes a certain type of thing. And and of course. Uh, yeah, you're saying. Well, give the the other thing is. Is um the what you draw upon with when it came to bending plays a role in how you're using it. Like when Z to use it, to use an example from the show when Zuk Zuko's fire bending was rooted in his in his in his rage, but once that was more or less resolved, um he wasn't able to fire bend for a while until he and until he ended up taking a new a new approach after meeting the Sun Warriors. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of layers even within that element, which is why it's uh, flexible enough that even though it it did sort of embody certain ideals or uh, personalities, you would still find a, a vast variety of people and personalities under that element that would still make sense. And I did. I did want that sort of flexibility with the spheres as well, but uh, without like completely emulating like a typical element system, uh, but still in a way that was you know familiar, mm -hmm. and I sort of came across the idea of using uh, celestial spheres because uh, the idea of Voyager itself is about uh, exploration and all that, and also partly influenced from Destiny as well because uh, Destiny also had this very um, very clear motif around like exploring the stars and discovering new worlds so the idea of having these uh, celestial spheres uh, I think fit that sort of theme I wanted to catch mm -hmm. I can I can I can certainly get behind that um, now with that, with that in mind, um, one of the other things that was that was introduced was was the was the action system that you're going with, having a more um, action based approach. In the in earlier drafts, did you end up did you end up using a more traditional standard action, move action, free action kind of economy? Um, so I think because. Uh... In the very first versions of Voyager, I already I already was uh, looking into systems like Pathfinder. Uh, I think learning about Pathfinder's uh, action uh, point system was sort of what 
um, uh, heavily drove me into like working uh, on the first version in earnest, and that was sort of the main, the first basis I used for uh, my action system, which was using an action point system because. Um, of course, with the action type system, which is the bonus action uh, reaction thing that uh, fifth edition uses, it does lead to uh, a lot of strange situations where you're not sure if, like, you have a bonus action you can use, but you don't have a spell that uses it, so you can't do anything, or you know, a, a lot of these sort of situations where if that type of action is not applicable, you can't use it. Um, and action points uh, does make it a lot more freeform that you can just sort of conceivably uh, spend or perform any action using by tallying it up by its point cost. Um, but then while designing Voyager some more and looking into you know the differences between them proper, uh, the action point system and the action type system, what I did realize is that it does make it quite um, quite tough for two things. Number one is a lot, I guess, bigger types of uh, bigger types of actions or just sort of general homebrewing where you're trying to figure out um, you know, each action you're sort of ascribing different values to them and you're sort of kind of guessing uh, how much it will be worth? Like, is it really is it powerful enough to be one or two or three? Uh, because you know, it's one, two, three is a bit more abstract than saying something is a, a regular action or reaction, which is a bit more, I think, a, probably a bit more intuitive for a normal player. Um, but so that was that was a sort of shortcoming I noticed with the system, but I still kind of generally liked the action point system so then <coughs> excuse me so then what i sort of came across while working on uh on how to revise this um is to sort of kind of merge the two or have like a kind of hybrid thing where currently uh it's sort of both at the same time where you had three action points um, you had three action points, but the cost of uh, the action sort of determines the type. So, mm -hmm. it's if it's a, a one action point action, uh, one AP, it will be a fast action. If it was two AP, uh, it will be a medium, and if three, it will be a slow uh, action. And this means that on a turn that you had. Uh, three AP to use, you could either do uh, three fast actions at once, I mean uh, in a row, mm -hmm. so like one AP, one AP, one AP, or you could do uh, a medium and a fast, so two AP and one AP, or you could do a uh, slow action, three AP, but you know, in the end it had to add up to three, basically. And, uh, and you could, uh, and this allowed for some granularity in uh, for the same action like you know a sword attack uh, just uh, the duration of it uh, sort of added a sense of a flavor or tangibility to what you were doing where did you want to make um, and this is like the same action you know sort of like a singular sword strike do you want to do a fast action meaning to just like do a quick jab do you want a medium, which is you know like a regular slash, or do you want to do it like a slow action where you sort of really uh, wind up a big swing, and that sort of conveyed in uh, the duration plus uh, the duration is sort of uh, what I'm defining it, uh, sort of what is called in the books. So when you read the book, you will uh, find it called fast, medium, or slow, mm -hmm. but the action point cost is there for you to like uh know in a more concrete manner uh how you would sort of divvy up those points uh, when you're in the middle of combat and all that because uh because there is like a um, 
a reaction system because as mentioned before i wanted the feeling of being able to sort of spontaneously react to different actions whether it's an ally or an enemy and to do that uh, sort of what i arrived at uh, is having it so that if you did an action so let's say 2 ap a medium action then uh then that action had a reaction limit so uh if anyone wanted to react to it it would only add up to uh add up to 2 ap or your action cost so you know if i spent uh if an enemy spent 2 ap to attack uh either i can react to it with uh 2 ap of my own a medium or or two different people could spend one fast action each which is one ap uh to retaliate and uh eventually just had to add up into uh the total action spent for that so uh for me that's sort of what i arrived at because before this uh i thought you know uh, why not just have everyone react to each other endlessly so if he reacts then any number of people can react and and then you could just like chain them infinitely uh, uh but then uh, after watching uh a matt colville video about his own uh rpg mcdm rpg and how he sort of experimented with that kind of very fluid initiative that was very fun but it led to people kind of getting confused about whose turn it was and all that uh he sort of realized that there needed to be some sort of limit in place to allow that kind of spontaneous reaction but sort of maintain the structure around it to keep the game going and so that's so i took uh, i took that lesson to heart and sort of figured okay so if people can't react infinitely towards each other um then perhaps you know you could uh if someone uh did an action and then you reacted to it uh then that constitutes one turn so one turn of action and reaction uh then no one else can act for that turn and then the next turn begins and then someone else does something and someone else reacts and then that continues until uh everyone has spent up all the actions and then the round concludes and starts over mm-hmm. but you know that's all all the granular uh game design talk but that's sort of yeah. the gist of that well this sort of getting into the weeds is my stock and trade <laughs> mm-hmm. so i think the 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 next logical step for me to, for me to go into is the is the way health was reworked because when I was when I was going through it the first thing that came to mind oddly enough was a PS3 was a PS3 RPG called Resonance of Fate or End of Eternity oh mm. because of, because of the two types of damage that that game had so I'm I'm curious what brought on the um divi- the divided approach to health in the in the rework um so for me uh i did like the idea of a break system so uh it is called break in this one uh and your health is called a resolve Mm -hmm. um let's see because um uh i did enjoy games that you could build like a sort of stagger meter or some kind of stun meter on a target so that it had you know you could build up a form of um a form of way to defeat or debilitate a target without necessarily just damaging them but um from what i notice um a lot of games do still feel like the stagger or break bar is just damaging them either way because you know um if you're damaging them you reduce the health and if you damage them you build up their break bar or whatever and then you fully break them so in the end you're kind of 
approaching it the same way. Uh, so then, uh, I wanted it so that Break interacted more with like status effects and uh, maybe more larger hits because um, having uh, the two types of health bar kind of helped me sort of better convey the idea of uh, smaller, more incremental damage like flesh wounds versus really more big impactful hits and that's sort of like where the more granular resolve system whereas you know within like increments of 20 versus the break uh, bars which are total of 5 which are less but therefore you know more impactful when they're removed and the idea is that uh, how, it, how it works here is that it's sort of like having multiple health bars where uh, you have um, five break bars and you have like a health bar for each and each time that you lose uh, you reach zero health or resolve in this case uh, you also lose one break bar and then it resolves uh, it re resets your resolve back so you know it's sort of like uh, to, to make it sound less abstract is, is sort of what you expect when you see like a boss in a video game that has multiple health bars when you're fully depleted or you know certain criteria and uh, this was something that is common obviously in JRPGs and such and of course one of the approaches I wanted to take is to make it very familiar uh, to like modern gamers because that's sort of uh, kind of the audience that I'm sort of targeting because that's sort of where I'm coming from as well as a person uh, into this hobby because uh, I think compared to a lot of tabletop designers uh, I myself am very very new to the hobby I wasn't you know uh, I didn't grow up with D&D uh, &D or any role playing games per se but I definitely grew up a lot with uh, movies, with video games, more more of those types of hobbies. So uh, knowing that that's the kind of mindset that I carried uh, into designing Voyager, I would think that uh, people who share those interests, which is I think a very, very common and large audience, would um, find that same appeal in uh, in Voyager and also find it uh, at least a bit easier to learn because they have these readily familiar concepts that would um, make learning a completely new system a lot easier because they're just these very uh, familiar concepts like these multiple health bars and uh, these JRPG style breaks and and a lot of these familiar terms, but actually, when I when I saw the brave and break mechanics, I was a bit curious if you ha if at one point in the past you had um, dipped into Dissidia. Ah, yes, 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 yes. I actually was a, uh, I was very very uh, intrigued by Dissidia back when I played it in college because I just really liked. Uh, it was just very a very novel idea for me, the idea of bravery, because how it worked in that game is you sort of took, you had like different attacks to take bravery uh, from your opponent and then dish it out as damage to them. Uh, it's a very complex system that I won't go into because you just kind of had to see it in play to kind of understand how it works. Yeah, I'm, but I I used to organize the city of tournaments, um, in my in yeah. my local area, um, a long time ago, um, and for a short while I did it again when the city of NT came around. But mm. both, but in both in both cases, you there's there is a certain pattern, and since I brought up Resonance of Fate, I sh I should explain um the damage system within that so you can kind of get a feel for why I drew that conclusion. Um, yep. Within within it and in J in Japan it in Japan it was called End of it um called End of Eternity. In 
the U.S. it was called Residence of Fate. I had thought the reason why they went with the name change was because um, End of Eternity is an Asimov novel, but from what I understand, that wasn't the case. Oh. Um, <laughs> there are two types... Now, everything is resolved with firearms with within that game, but mm. there are two there are two types of... There, there are two major types to deal with. Um, and that being scratch damage and direct damage. Scratch damage is usually done through machine guns. Um, whether it be full whether it be full on machine guns or or SMGs, basically any any kind of automatic weapon. Um, and while the it while it does a lot of damage, that damage does not stick. And if you just leave it as scratch damage, you're not going to take out enemies, and it's going to recover quickly. The other mm. end is direct damage, which is usually done through pistols and, and the like. It doesn't do a lot of damage, but direct damage does reduce HP and makes any scratch damage that they're inflicted with permanent. Ah, I see. So, yeah, yeah, it's sort of like chip damage in fighting games, right? Yeah, I would, I would say, I would say that, and there's usually. In a lot of fighting games, especially 2D fighting games, there's usually a means to re to recover um, damage taken in the short term. Um, yeah, which is which is the reason why you tend to see damage um, in that in that sort of faded out approach. Bloodborne does a, does a similar thing with how it handles damage that's rooted in its um, parry system. Hmm. And. I, fi I find it interesting that th that this is a pa this is a pattern that was um, pr that was present th throughout it. Um, now, one of the th one of the things I noticed is the fact that Brave is is something that is going to is going to activate when um, when your die and the con and the contested die um, is a match. Now. Die matching is go is is going to is going to be a relatively low is going to be a relatively low affair. The bigger die size you go with is is that part is that part of the trade off? Um. Yeah. Uh. Do know that I'm, I'm by no means like a dice statistician or anything like that, but uh, it is sort of mitigated by allowing you to roll. Uh, multiple dice, and of course, a bigger dividends because you know a bigger die means uh, bigger damage. But uh, I've not, you know, I've not been fully confident in the actual like mechanical, like how 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 sound it is like uh, mechanically. But why I'm committing it, committing to it is mostly because of the kind of uh. The kind of gameplay I wanted to evoke because, uh, and this is another example from like actual video games, which is, um, I was, uh, I happened to be watching, uh, some gameplay of Zenless Zone Zero, which is another Hoyoverse game, but essentially it's sort of like a real time action game, and uh, sort of like something you would expect from like. Uh, like actual Honkai Impact or uh, Devil May Cry or Punishing Grey Raven, uh, these or near Auto near Automata, these kinds of character action, action. games. Oh uh, yeah, and uh, what I noticed uh, that I found really uh, fun and intriguing while watching these games is uh, the idea of parrying and dodging, which as a concept was something that I always was interested uh, in doing for Voyager but I never really got like how to do it because you know obviously parrying and dodging is very timing centric um, so it's kind of it felt like an impossible thing to do within the scope of a turn based game so that was something I had to like kind of ring my head around but after working on this particular die system and watching that gameplay, 
I've sort of got the idea that, you know, maybe uh, I can't replicate the feeling of timing it perfectly, but what about rolling it perfectly? And that sort of came to the idea of, uh, what if your roll, uh, as in, you know, you roll a tree and the enemy rolled a tree, and the kind of idea came about that, you know, if you match numbers, that kind of, this is the kind of idea that, oh, your weapons clash or something is aligned at the perfect moment. And that kind of gave me the idea that from there, I could create the idea of, um, like, if you're trying to dodge and that role matches the enemy, uh, you execute a brave dodge, which is like a perfect dodge. And that puts you into a state, like a bullet time state. So similar to what you see in Nier or Punishing Grey Raven. And mechanically, it just means you can take a free action. But in the language of that, it sort of helped evoke the idea that you perfectly time the dodge and then you kind of, kind of imagine your character entering this sort of bullet time state where they can do something really quick. and. And of course, the idea of a parry where uh, if your attack instead uh, matches an enemy's attack at the same time, you sort of deflect your blow. And of course, in games, this sort of happens no matter how much bigger the enemy is than you. It's just sort of a thing that is guaranteed to happen if you time it right. And that's, and that's a very fun idea and something that I wanted to replicate as well. And it is capturing uh, this feel was what led me to uh, going with this particular dice system. So that kind of has been my general design philosophy for Voyager all this time, because you know I know that you know I'm not particularly uh, well versed nor skilled in like calculating the actual mass of it or mechan mechanics of it. Um, but what I do know and hope to do as well as possible is to sort of evoke uh, that sort of fun or the kind of idea of the stuff that I played. Mm -hmm. How do I replicate it in a tabletop form with as little mass as possible? And that's kind of the main thesis that has kind of driven how I designed Voyager. And if the math does end up working out, then even better. But of course, it's still in a place that stage. But I do hope it works out, if only for the fact that I want to capture that certain feel in the gameplay. Yeah. Would it be fair of me to say that you want um, Brave to have the same kind of endorphin effect that rolling a natural 20 has? Yeah, essentially, I would say that because obviously it doesn't have like uh, we don't have like a D twenty here, but um, but yeah, essentially the idea of rolling a nat twenty or and of course, like I said, combined with the idea that uh, because before this, like just a few weeks before, uh, I s I saw the idea was um, when you rolled your action. So when you roll your die, you could choose to roll yourself roll another die. So uh, you will be rolling these two dice. And if they both match, then uh, you will create a brave uh, action. But then after thinking about it, I sort of figured, you know, why did you have to roll another die when the enemy is already like rolling one against you? Uh, because it's an opposed roll system. Uh, and of course, you want to sort of uh, cut out as much time from you know rolling and the sort of bookkeeping stuff as much as possible, and then uh, I figured you know why not cut the middleman? You don't have to roll the extra dice when your enemy is already doing it. So if your dice matches the enemy's dice, then uh, this occurs as opposed to you yourself rolling against the enemy twice. Mm -hmm. Which make which makes sense. You you don't want to fall into the same trap of of conf, of critical confirmation or in um in d twenty based games or the or the um damage rolls that ha 
that were in uh, World of Darkness. Um, in the case of the yeah. former, you, and this was some this was something that has largely fallen by the wayside. It's a case of you you would crit, then you'd roll to confirm. It was only if you crit again that you do double damage. Otherwise, you just do max damage. So it was it was a real deflating experience where somebody gets that endorphin where they roll crit, um, but they don't get the vaunted double damage because they didn't confirm. Um, and yeah. in World of Darkness, you had to once you get once you rolled to see how once you um got a, got a hit and and we're starting to starting to get damage. You'd roll those damage dice to determine what actually would transfer into wounds. So you could have a situation yeah. where you got a bunch of die that you rolled, but only like one or two of them actually inflicted wounds. Yeah, and even here, uh, I sort of wasn't quite on board of having like a dice pool system, uh, but I did eventually sort of uh, kind of figured I had to have them uh, as you know that bonus dice because it's a way to have some sort of uh, progression and of course to help uh, help people guarantee more consistent results so you know a higher chance of getting a matching number if you roll multiple dice uh, which of course can help some unluckier players who you know may not roll perfectly every time obviously and uh, and even then I'd say the bonus dice is still more uh, kind of supplementary to the core system which is you know the matching dice kind of uh, idea mm -hmm. so with I know um oh. I know it's I know it's a ca a case of um, a case of learning on the job, but believe me when I say, despite despite my background, you are in good company when it comes to starting this out without having a wealth of experience. Um, mm -hmm. There's plenty. There's no there's no shortage of first timers that have paid their visit to the temple. Hmm. Uh, and. It's one of the it's one of those things I tr I try and make make clear to people, like not ev not everybody who dives into this is somebody who's been playing since they since they oh since they hopped out of their mother's crib or something like that. Yeah. And now with with within that, I I do appreciate that you do have a a um. A faction, a faction system, um, was that, which does me does lead me to one thing when it comes to Voyager tactics. This is a this is a kind of a chicken and egg question, but was it a case where the world came first and then you started building the rules for it, or vice versa? Uh, yeah, definitely the world first. So for me, it's always has been, I guess, across all of my design regarding Voyager Tactics is always the idea of uh, what is it what do I want to evoke or what do I want to replicate uh, whether I saw it in an anime or a game or anything like that uh, what do I want to replicate in game and then how would I mechanically go about doing so uh, and, <laughs> and avoid uh, as much mass as possible while doing it Which makes which makes sense, and to that to that end, I am I am curious if um, if if within these because the other thing that I noticed when I when I came to looking at um, what I was able to find with character creation, you're you're not exactly going for archetype. You're not exactly going for classes, but more going for archetypes. Is that correct? Uh, so, how would you define the difference? A class has a has a set list of ab list of abilities that you're go that you're going to be getting at particular thresholds. 
where that threshold is based on level or based on total experience or something else. The point is that so at certain threshold, you're going to be getting this particular feature. An archetype is a, is a, is a broader approach where it is bit where it is instead of building upon particular features, it's building upon the idea of things that you're going to be slightly better at than a, than a baseline, but isn't outright giving you a set, a set of things that you're that you are um, that you're going to be grabbing at each level. Um, that is, that is the key difference between a class-based design and an archetype-based design. Archetype is kind of a middle ground between class-based and freeform. Right. Like an extreme version of freeform, I'd say would be would be something like um, GURPS. Yeah. You know, where you can do you can do just about anything in GURPS, <laughs> but that mm -hmm. comes with its own consequences. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Again, I guess on the other end is something like fifth edition. I guess. Uh, yeah, or just about it. Just about any um. Just about any class. Ba just about any class based affair would fit. Uh, yeah. I guess it's something that I think I noticed probably has been kind of an increasing uh trend within at least. Uh, anime style uh, tabletops that I've been researching as well. So stuff like mm, Fabula Ultima and uh, Cloud Breaker Alliance, they both uh, they both kind of have multi-classing already baked into its system. Where at character creation, uh, the classes there are treated more as jobs and. Uh, in Voyager, they're called ventures, which is uh, kind of a more uh, kind of a more flashy name, but it it, it still essentially means it means like a job. Uh, is the most accurate term I'd use, where it's more indicative. It's more indicative of a uh, a life path that you've chosen or a profession, because you know your job is only like one aspect of who you are, um, and I think that word sort of conveys the idea I wanted to catch, which is uh, the idea that you can change your jobs, you can sort of have aspects of one job and aspects of another, so it becomes more of like a skill set. So you may have a skill set of bits of this, so, you know, especially if you're like a tabletop. A designer you would understand this well because you know you kind of have to do a little bit of everything you have to be a bit of an editor you have to be a bit of uh, a layout person a bit of a game designer a bit of here and there so is that kind of general idea that you would mix and match um, abilities or features from these archetypes and that sort of kind of forms the whole of uh, your character but of course, uh, but of course, I still wanted. Uh, I didn't want something that was too, you know, free form. Otherwise, uh, obviously, it kind of leads to uh, paralysis, choice paralysis, where you kind of have to, mm -hmm. you're not sure where to go. So, uh, so the archetypes that I have in the game are very much uh, focused around certain uh, player fantasies and how I would. Like describe this is similar to how the champions in League of Legends or Overwatch or any of these kind of hero-based uh, games are designed, where the character the character has like a very a very um, a very uh, limited or not let's not say limited, but they have like a very uh, strong set of abilities that very clearly. Uh, point to how you're supposed to play this character. So if someone is like a tank, then all of their abilities are sort of towards facilitating that. So uh, so it's these archetypes, these ventures that is sort of informed how I uh, designed them because I wanted to capture very clear uh, player fantasies or, you know, which 
which translate to you know sort of characters that you want to play so like whether you want to play a valiant knight or you want to play like sort of uh like a jetpack using soldier or you want to play like a ninja and they had these core abilities that very clearly uh hone into that specific fantasy and if you wanted to you could treat it as a class and just uh go entirely into that singular venture so you just you know you just treat it as a class and you will level only that and essentially you have your vanilla uh ninja or whatever you want or if you are a more experienced player or if you had like a very strong character idea in, in mind you could just take a bit of the ninja and you wanted something else like a mage then you would take a bit from the mage and it, and that sort of uh, kind of the approach I took with the the class design in this game. Mm-hmm. Um, and looking th- looking through the ventures that you have, this definitely falls within the um, archetype end of that pendulum uh, because yeah. of the fact that what I what I see out of this is a starting package and a bit of a leaning, but. As far, but but at the higher end, at the higher end of the spectrum, it's largely leaving you to your own devices. Um, yeah. Though this, though, um, looking at this and looking at the spheres, I did come to a realization, and may, maybe this is something you can consider down the road, is to look at the spheres as as um. Not as a one to one, but something akin to the um col- the mana colors in Magic the Gathering. Oh, that, I mean that was a reference actually. So, oh, so the, definitely in the sense that um Garfield had said that he wanted a deck in Magic the Gathering to be akin to a character sheet, and mm. when you look at the colors. Um, and the they each of them kind of denotes a certain playstyle, to the point where if somebody says that they're running, say, a re- a red white deck, even if you can't, even if you don't see any of the cards in that deck, you can make some reasonable assumptions as to the playstyle of that deck. Yeah. Um, uh, and same thing. Same thing goes if somebody is doing color. If somebody's doing colorless or doing what's known as a rainbow deck, where somebody's using all f- using all five. Although those are kind of rare, and of course, then there's the people who use sliver decks, we, who we know, who we refer to as uncultured swine. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I am biased. I mean, when I was running Yu-Gi-Oh, I did I did a. I had I had a particularly infamous gravekeeper deck that everybody hated because it was like drunken boxing. It would always find some new way to hit you. Like very uh, adaptable, I guess. Well, what what would happen like... is some somebody would try somebody would try and um, and just and just play and just play full defense, and then I'd start switching over to mo- to monsters and tactics that do that. Don't bother with that and just do direct attacks, or would f- or find ways to just get to just get, ri- or and going on the defensive, um, have it fo- have it force ag- have it force against the tanks, or you know the just constantly varying up the tactics so, so it so it's very hard to read where the next move is going to come from. That's the much like how somebody who somebody who's an adept with drunken boxing. It's going to be very difficult to see what angle you're going to get hit with. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Oh. And because I can, I can kind of see that with some, with some of the um, ventures that I that I saw within it, since several of them are clear are several of the ventures clearly have a leaning. Towards so, towards some um, towards some pr- approaches, um, mm. I can't. Even though I'm not, even though I haven't played a whole lot of Arc Knights, I can see some of the influence in how you um, st- how you structured the how you structured the approach, especially given the symbol design that you ha- that you have. 
Ah, uh, um, yes, definitely. With um, Valiants, va um, Vanguards, Strikers, and Watchers. Um, uh, in, a roundabout, yeah. in a roundabout way, it does remind me of the four-roll setup that was in 4th edition, the edition of D&D I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because, <laughs> I, because I'm not getting paid. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, in that one, you had... Um, you had def you had leader, uh, defender, striker, and controller. Yeah, yeah, correct. Um, leaders were your were your bu were your party buffs and supporters. Um, defenders were your tanks, and in particular, the ones who are good at getting all the getting all the attention on them, since every defender class had some sort of aggro control. Um, strikers were your glass cannons. You know, able to do a lot of damage, but not able to take a lot of damage. And controllers were your AoEs and your um, debuffs. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is essentially that both the numbers filed off, except for striker. Mm -hmm. Because that is that is uh, I did do a lot of research into fourth edition as well. Yeah, and it, um. Uh, it is a it is a bit amusing that I that so so many people keep in, keep insisting that fourth edition was was tr was trash, but I keep seeing games that were taking inspiration from it. Like pe people tell people keep telling me that nobody liked fourth edition yet I and yet there's yet there's stuff like this <laughs> or um or thir or thirteenth age although that's a bit cheating because that was made by uh, that was co made by one of the Designers of Fourth Edition, um, yeah. or stuff like Lancer or Gubat Banwa or Beacon, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. pe Unchained Heroes is another one. People taking cues from um, Fourth Edition, and it's it's one of it's one of those things. It's one of those things that's kind of um, that's kind of amusing. Then again. Everybody kept. Everybody keeps talking about how Fourth Edition was trying to turn D and D into an MMO, and conveniently forgets that twenty three years ago people were saying that um, Third Edition was turning D and D into Diablo. <laughs> oh, I th I, f I feel like that. I feel like much like w much like with the Schumacher Batman movies, there was a bit of a Mandela effect going on, where pe where people. Pretend where people pretended that something was true, even what, even if it wasn't. You know, like after the after the Schumacher Batman movies came out, there were people who were claiming that Batman was always grim dark until until the Schumacher movies mucked it up. Yeah, which is not true because the Silver Age of comics exists, which can best be described as drugs. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. I mean, the effect of like fourth edition is kind of very similar in pattern to like, I guess how the Star Wars prequels were received. Yeah, every... I like, am, I like do... regards the quality, just like just the reception to it. Um. And yet, and yet, though, and yet, those same people were at midnight showings. <laughs> just say, just saying. <laughs> I, I mean, I was at those midnight showings too, but at least I'm honest about it. Yeah. But you had, and the th the thing is, for as for as there have been there has been a a somewhat reevaluation of the of the prequels now that worse stuff has co has come out. <clears throat> Disney, <clears throat> sorry, needed to yeah. clear my throat for a bit. <laughs> oh. Where people are realizing how good they actually had it, but I, I mean, do depending on depending on how one D and D goes, uh, uh, we could get the same effect. Well, we get well. Um, Tales of the Valiant is on is on the horizon, which I ha which I've I've covered some of the playtest material for that, and I think that that is a perfect alternative for people who are burned by some of the things that one D and D is doing. Mm. I know they're not calling it one D and D anymore, and they're trying to call it fifth edition, but the name's gonna stick, so deal with it. <laughs> but yeah, I don't. Th but 
I will I will admit that I I have looked at some of the playtest material and when I saw what they did with the warlock I ended up um having a flipping the table moment hmm. because it was a masterclass in missing the point. Yeah. Cuz the big selling the big appeal with warlocks is the is even if they don't get as many spell casting slots as everybody else, their slots upgrade automatically. Hmm. Oh, and they get them back on a short rest. All of that was taken away, and they were just made into another half caster. Is that right? Oh. Which there's already plenty of those. And if you're if you're going to make them into a half caster, at least give them something to balance that out. Yeah. Oh. I mean. Tales of the Valiant is making them a half caster, but it's also doubling down on expanding the invocation system that Warlocks had, and, ha and yeah, having good. it actually and having pacts actually scale with you in terms of what you get out of them. It's not a case of getting something right out of the gate and then that's it. No, you're getting that and other things as you level up. Hmm. Which I'd say that softens the blow a little. I mean, I still, I still think, I still think warlocks end up getting picked way too much, but that's just my own biases. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was a warlock main, so I think you might be right. Well, <laughs> I've been, I've been, I've been doing monk, I've been maining monks even in, even in the dark ages of of the hobby, so I'm not one to talk. Because yeah, everybody likes monks now. They, they, um. They don't know the pain of having to be, of having to be a monk main in the third edition days, where that were you needed high stats in everything just to be decent. Mm. Um, it's something that I've that is known as multiple ability dependency or mad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, um, correct. Now, given the given the freeform nature of ventures, has the has the subject has the subject of multi-classing been broached of somebody who may ha may have started out with a particular venture but wants to dip into something dip into a different venture as a campaign goes on uh yeah so that was multi-classing was something that kind of influenced a great deal of the venture design because it was just something that I knew uh, would be a thing that people would uh, come to eventually and that of course is tied in with a whole network of other concepts that I had to work out at the same time you know like uh, experience gain and all that so that's still being tested but what I guess my my uh, my guiding principle on trying to you know, make that happen it was to sort of, you know, make sure that multi-classing was as simple as possible. Uh, because uh, I don't, you know, I don't design things uh, to be simple for its own sake. Uh, I do it because uh, for the sake of my own intelligence, because uh, I, I designed the game a lot around the fact that if I can't remember half the stuff that I worked on then it probably wasn't important and needs to be cut out and kind of whatever I do remember is probably the stuff that was important um, so and that kind of applies to you know playing the game as well and what a new player would experience and so for multiclassing it's kind of just as simple as uh, you have you know a set amount of XP and all abilities are sort of have a uniform XP cost, so it's almost like you're picking. Uh, it's almost like a skill tree that you're just putting skill points into to buy it. But um, in order to multi-class, uh, so each, so in here they have classes and multi-class uh, classes and subclasses, mm -hmm. and the subclasses are more specialized. They have certain. They require you to be. Uh, a certain sphere in order to take it and 
uh, what the base the base uh, venture or class is uh, free form, meaning you know you can have any sphere and take it. But if you want to specialize, then you have to build your characters in a way. But if you wanted to multi-class across different ventures, uh, you could already do that at character creation. Um, you could pick, you can pick like two uh, starting abilities, and you could pick it. You could pick two from the same uh, class or one from two different classes, and based on that. But there's like uh, two criteria, so uh, in order to multi class. So each uh, class has its own, uh, it's called a core training, which is basically like, it's sort of like a core mechanic that uh, allows for the rest of the class to function properly. So it's sort of like, it could be a passive or it could be any sort of thing that it basically, if it, it, it requires you to take it first because without it, the rest of the class mechanically doesn't really work. So of course you have to take it first, but then after you take it, you can sort of learn anything else within uh, that class. So that's fine. Uh, and then in order to go into a subclass, um, the only criteria to, for that is to enter a subclass, you had to learn all the abilities in the base class first. And that's just the, uh, and that is, that is the meat and bones of what multiclassing is. That's the only requirement, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can, I can get behind that. Now, with the, with that with that said, um, I know I know that you I know that you just put out the um point f the point five version, but in in the process of doing this, what would you say? were some of the biggest um, takeaways you had as far as the learning experience of making um, Voyager Tactics? Hmm. That is quite general, like... Like, what do you mean specifically? Like, um, like just like how to design it, or...? I'd say, I'd say the... I'd say the... The big one would be, would be what sort of... Le what sort of lesson you ended up learning um, that you... You either you either didn't know at first or th or thought you knew when it came to, um, tape when it came to tabletop design, that you en you ended up learning, um, on on the job essentially. Hmm. I don't think an answer comes to me immediately, but I guess one thing that. I guess one thing that I guess sticks out to me is just uh I guess more of the community. I'm quite um surprised that, you know, even though tabletop itself is already a very niche kind of um, you know, hobby. And I thought, you know, I was just gonna make this for fun. But, you know, while making it and sharing with people, I got a lot of unexpected uh, support from people, some who play it, uh, but some who also just uh, like the world or the setting and just want to like either learn more about the world or actually even financially support it to sort of help make the actual book, uh, you know, final release a reality. And I think that's probably what uh, surprised me the most and also made me endeared me a lot to a tabletop design in particular is because of the community, how close-knit it seemed and uh, everyone seems to be uh, overlap a lot in certain communities, especially if you play like outside of D&D because D&D is almost like its own community. But if you play like play or know about other systems, then there seems to be like a great overlap between people, between streamers. Uh, people like uh, Dice Queen D, for example, and even she sort of knows different uh, creators within the space, like uh, the Fabula Ultima creator, Emma. And it's just like, mm -hmm. and I think that's sort of what uh, my takeaway is, is that it 
I I wasn't really expecting to work on the game to the extent it is now, but I think it's because of the community and how supportive it is that it's continued to drive me to make it and sort of uh, to the end that I actually think that uh, the actual full 1.0 release is actually possible and something to actually look forward to. Mm -hmm. And I will I will certainly be keeping an eye out on it. But mm. with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the particular bit of madness that happens around here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>